the sad real-life story of Frederick March. Lesser-known secrets about Frederick March. Frederick March was one of the most gifted performers of his day. Carrying himself in dignity and poise, he took on a variety of roles and fully devoted himself to his many portrayals. Though often overshadowed by some of his peers, his films and legacy are well worth exploring. March was born Ernest Frederick McIntyre Bickle on August 31st, 1897. His mother, Cora Brown Marcher, was a school teacher, and his father, John F. Bickle, was a Presbyterian church elder who worked in the hardware business. The family resided in Racine, Wisconsin, where young Frederick spent the majority of his early years. He attended Winslow Elementary School and Racine High School. Bickle was elected class president during his last year of grammar school. His senior year of high school and again during his senior year of college. After high school, he attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he earned a degree in economics, while also managing the football team and participating on the track team. Upon his graduation with honors, Frederick served as an artillery lieutenant in World War I and entered the working world as a banker for First National City Bank. But an emergency appendectomy caused him to reconsider his career path. While recovering, his property owner, who happened to be a former actress, shared anecdotes about her days in the theater. Frederick was mesmerized. Rather than pursuing the life of a banker, Frederick rerouted to a career in show business, working as an extra in films made in New York City. Interestingly, Frederick is credited as saying, I have earnestly and devoured to perform my own share without fuss or temperament. An actor has no more right to be temperamental than a bank clerk. Possibly, a very sane bringing up as a child has helped me to retain my sense of proportion in these matters. It was around this time that Frederick adopted a shortened form of his mother's maiden name and began appearing as Frederick March. Since he considered 12 his lucky number, he shortened Frederick to Frederick and Marcher to March. As the New Year's Day, 1924, Frederick March was born and actively seeking employment as an actor. He modeled arrow shirts, craviots, shoes, and shaving creams in order to earn extra money while auditioning for various performances. In 1926, he found employment on Broadway and signed a film contract with Paramount Pictures by the end of the decade. In 1927, he married actress Florence Elridge. The couple adopted two children, Penelope, Penny, and Anthony, and remained married until March's passing. Once March arrived in Hollywood, it did not take long for him to emerge as a key player. He received an Oscar nomination in 1930 for a role based upon John Barrymore in the film The Royal Family of Broadway, 1930. He won the Academy Award in 1932 for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, 1931. He tied with Wallace Beery, who was nominated for the champ, 1931, though he won by one vote. Afterwards, he starred in a series of several films, 
which were based upon classic texts. March was a moderate smoker and mild drinker. He loved to write letters and kept up a massive correspondence. Enjoying his celebrity, he never allowed publicity men to ghostwrite articles for him, as he preferred to write and respond to newspapers and magazines on his own. Somewhere along the way, March found the time to sign some autographs. Here is my Frederick March signature from my personal collection. Overall, March was also extremely active. He would keep in shape by swimming, playing tennis, horseback riding, playing golf, and traveling. Incidentally, he made tours for the USO that covered roughly 40,000 miles while also volunteering at the stage door canteen and participating in other fundraising activities. Additionally, he enjoyed reading and photography. March strategically avoided signing any long-term contracts with studios, which allowed him to appear in films produced by several different film studios. In fact, he came in second in an audience poll for the role of Rhett Butler in 1939's Gone with the Wind. After a 10-year absence from the stage, March returned to Broadway, but starred in a flop. Nonetheless, he devoted himself to the stage as much as he had to films and would go on to earn two Best Actor Tony Awards. He won his second Oscar for his favorite movie role in The Best Years of Our Lives, 1946. In between this balancing act of stage and film roles, producer Jesse L. Lasky fought to convince Warner Brothers to produce a screen biography about American author Mark Twain. March had been suggested by Twain's only living daughter, Clara Clemens Garble was Kostich, who informed Lasky that she would not help with the film unless March starred in it as her father. Nonetheless, March was doubtful about taking on the role of Twain. He finally accepted the role after shooting a test scene of himself made up to be a 65-year-old Mark Twain. When a picture from this screen test surfaced, Twain's daughter thought that someone had discovered a new archival photo of her father. While most of March's work after 1950 was on the stage, he did appear on television. In fact, he co-hosted the Academy Awards ceremony from New York City with co-host Donald O'Connor in Los Angeles in 1954. With his career shifting back to the stage, March moved east to a Connecticut farm and happened to be neighbors with playwright Arthur Miller. In fact, March was offered the role of Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman, 1949 but regrettably turned it down. Though March focused more upon the stage, he did not completely abandon the film industry. He appeared in The Desperate Hours, 1955, with Humphrey Bogart and Spencer Tracy, a fellow Wisconsin native, as well as in the 1960 film, Inherit the Wind. On February 12, 1959, March appeared before Congress to perform a reading of the Gettysburg Address in order to commemorate the anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth. This was not the only time that March performed in Washington. Apparently, in 1963, President John F. Kennedy 
called upon him to perform a dramatic reading at a White House dinner. March was diagnosed with prostate cancer and had to undergo surgery in 1970. Nonetheless, he still gave one last performance in 1973 for the Iceman Cometh. March passed away on April 14, 1975, in Los Angeles, and was cremated and buried under a favorite tree on his farm in Connecticut. The new Milford, Connecticut property was later leased to the playwright Lillian Hellman, as well as Henry Kissinger. Today, March's Racine home has not changed much on the outside. They remain on a street that is paved with the same brick paths that he would have remembered, just blocks away from breathtaking views of Lake Michigan. The residential area is quiet and charming, boasting quaint homes and tree-lined streets. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.